Uh, just a brief overview about what we do. So we started in 2013 when Luca joined ETH Zurich. And we wanted to research on new energy efficient architecture. So this is our goal. And uh, the keywords were parallel processing, near threshold uh, operation, energy efficiency. And we came up with parallel ultra low power platform. Everybody in the group at the time uh, liked Pulp Fiction. So that's why it was called Pulp. It's a large group of 60 people distributed over Zurich and University of Bologna. Contrary to popular belief, more people are in Zurich than there are in Bologna. And uh, not everybody is working on uh, hardware design. We have people working on technology. We have people working on uh, architecture, digital design, system design, and applications. And that creates a nice kind of atmosphere uh, because you know, we can learn from the work of the others and the, the ideas flow into each other. The thing that we are known for is we produce a lot of integrated circuits. So just for pulp, at the moment we have 36 ASICs taped out in the project. So that's roughly six a year. This is a breakdown. There's one more picture missing it because um, uh, the only picture we have of it is with, uh, you know, it's, it's on this corner of the wafer and the pieces of it are missing. Uh, I'll rectify it in the next thing. So important thing to remember is we are a research uh, group. Our work is about research. We are not in this for, uh, I don't know, being a provider for RISC-5 cores or open source hardware. Uh, it's a necessity for us, but our work was uh, trying to build architectures based on multiple cores or multiple systems. One of the observations is that the energy efficiency is higher at lower operating voltages. The other thing is, once you do this, once you're operating at a lower voltage, your performance drops because you know your cores aren't running at that speed. If ever possible, you would like to run them parallel as much as possible. And uh, it's obviously you have some work cases where this thing works very well, but the reality is different. You have to switch between operating modes, parallel operation, and uh, serial operation back and forth. And we like to look at methods to make these um, uh, overhead of switching from one mode to another as efficiently as possible. Uh, heterogeneous acceleration means that we try to uh, augment our systems with accelerators for specific domains. And uh, we try to find ways of making use of what the technology offers us. Recently, for example, we are doing a lot on uh, body biasing, automated body biasing techniques, etc., etc. And uh, so, Basically, people know us or they talk a lot about our course. So we have 32-bit and 64-bit course in open source. Uh, but they alone don't do much. So you need to combine them with peripherals, interconnect, and accelerators. And all together, you have systems that end up doing things. And our systems have sometimes FPGA implementations. They are only on FPGA. We actually have released a couple of projects, like the Hero, which primarily runs on an FPGA target. We then obviously have the ASICs that I talk so much about, and then, uh, but the end goal is also to make working systems out of the uh, things that we built. So this is um, a, our nano drone, the Pulp Dronet. It uses just 64 milliwatts and it's a tiny drone uh, that you can buy and you add a shield on it and it can uh, navigate itself or find itself on our corridor magically, and uh, only for 64 milliwatts, which is pretty amazing. Now, we, you are asking, or we are sometimes being asked, do you have some ASICs that we can use? So we are uh, a research institution, so some of the ASICs are, from the beginning, we know that they will be characterized on an IC tester in a laboratory environment. They're not necessarily meant for um, running things on an, uh, on an application domain. It happens more often than not that something that works well on a tester later ends up in an application board, but we sometimes have clear chips that are meant to go there. And then the second are the research demonstrators. We are cocky enough after a while and saying, hey, we can probably manage to make a chip with a couple of interfaces that we can put on a system that can run an application properly. It will fly around and do nice things. And then there's a third part which are the uh, industrial uses of our cores and peripherals. This is like one of the nicest stories. Uh, this is the um, OpenISA org um, developed or in collaboration with NXP. 
they took our course, they had their own SOC system and the entire development board, and they replaced or they added one RISCI and one IBEX core uh, together with the two ARM cores they have in a big little configuration. And you can buy this from Amazon at the moment. And we didn't know about it. I mean, they contacted us literally two weeks before the release and saying, hey, look what we did. And I said, wow, that's cool. And they said, yeah, we did uh, like 20,000 of them. It was, it was nice. And this is actually what we are all about. So all our development, we try to keep on GitHub. People ask us this a lot. The things that we release, we keep on working on them on the GitHub. We do not have internal, uh, I don't know, secret source uh, repositories where we keep things secret. Uh, we try to release everything. Now, the everything discussion is still going on. You had a lot of talks uh, these days. HDL source code, test benches, software development kit, virtual platform seem to be okay. It's not as clear cut as you think. We had a lot of discussions with some EDA companies which were very upset that we were releasing HDL source code saying that we are violating some NDA agreements and there's discussions still going on. Um, I'm sorry, we are releasing it under the permissive solder pad license. If that makes us bad people, we are bad people. It's a reality of what we are working on. I mean, we love uh, the, for us it's important that we can collaborate with other people that includes industry, that includes other research groups. And the permissive license is the thing that allows us to be able to collaborate with groups and people easily. Um, I, I uh, see that we had a few discussions with other people. It's just our reality and we respect all other uh, forms of licenses, but this doesn't make us a bad person, I guess. So as of 2019, everybody seems to talk about Palpino a lot. That was the first release that we did. 2016 February, but in the meantime, we have actually uh, releases of single core, cluster based, multi core platforms, or even multi cluster platforms that are released open source, as well as a huge range of peripherals, accelerators, and interconnect solutions that are there. So, this sort of kind of gives you the idea. Here are the cores, the peripherals, the interconnect. And uh, these are then combined into single core systems. So, there's Palpino, which was the simpler one, Palpissimo, the better one. And uh, what our research was actually mostly on this multi-core system. So there's a cluster with multiple RISC-5 cores, and outside there's actually um, a microcontroller that allows the interconnect to the outside world. Whereas we have also some systems where we have multiple clusters that scale up to uh, many tens of cores. So in the rest of the time, I just want to give you some uh, snippets of what we are doing and uh, the first one is a collaboration with QuickLogic. Now I have to say um, Brian is sitting here, CEO of uh, the uh, QuickLogic. I had these slides in before I realized he would be here. I just didn't remove it and it's a plug for his company but it was a very nice collaboration so this is why I have it in here. So this is a Palpissimo system. It has the memories on top. There is one single core the nice thing about the Palpissimo is that it allows us to add accelerators that access the same memory as the core does. And while we were talking uh, with, with QuickLogic, we said, hey, we can just take the FPGA and add it as an accelerator so that it has direct access to the memory and not only work as a peripheral working over the APB bus. At the same time, what is really nice is we have a, a DMA, a micro DMA, that copies data directly from the IOs to the memories without the inter, uh, without the processor. And uh, we can put the EFPGA in between that path. So while you're copying data, it can go into the EFPGA and you could pre-process, post-process the data that's going in and out all the while while the core is doing nothing. So you can use it as a normal accelerator connected as a peripheral. You can have it a peripheral that is smart and is talking with the outside world or you could have it as a filter in between the DMA and things. So this chip actually went back. Uh, it's called Arnold. We do not try to limit uh, the uh, name choices of our designers. So this is uh, David Eskewon and he's a big fan of bodybuilding and he thinks Arnold is a great guy. And so there it is. So this chip is back. We have already measured it. We're trying to publish results of it. 
uh, it's, it's pretty cool. The thing that I, I want to stress about it is the following. It took us one year from meeting Brian, shaking his hand and saying, what are you doing? We have this EFBJ, we have the system, until we taped out the, the chip. This is an enormously short amount of time for a chip in 22 nanometer to come to fruition from, you know, first saying hello to, yes, let's do something. And it's only possible because we are using this open source thing that we could add things in, into these things, or at least this is our uh, thing. So uh, about the others, so we had a bunch of chips that we sent. Uh, this is why you only see the layouts. These chips aren't back yet. So this is UMC 65 nanometer. Uh, it's mainly uh, student and research chips. So this one has been bugging us a lot. If you have been following and looking at our chips, there are no large uh, bandwidth interfaces. The reason is we cannot afford to make very large chips. If you cannot make a large chip, you do not have enough bandwidth on your periphery to move data in and out. So people would say, why don't you use a high-speed serial link? Well, guess what? You need to have files and you need to have uh, controllers for this and they don't come for free. And we didn't have one and our previous attempts at making one ourselves did not really work very well. So this is more or less the third attempt. And uh, it's called Plink or Pulp Link. And uh, on this side, you actually see a transceiver with uh, one receiver and one transmit channel. Hopefully, will give us a multi-gigabit channel uh, for working. Now, the questions will come. The transceiver is technology specific. At the moment, we cannot open source such things. It's not possible because of the reasons we talked about. Um, the uh, technology partner, UMC, we have NDAs with it that prevent us from releasing it. And the EDA companies do not like that we open source things which were ma made using their tools. So at the moment, we will not have a way of open sourcing it. Still, it gives the projects that we manufacture in 65 a chance to do something, and it's, it's for our research. The next one is uh, Xavier. So uh, this is what happens a lot. So we have a general chassis. In this case, it is actually, again, the same Palpissimo one that I was showing. Uh, what you see here is all memory. So there's 512 kilobytes of memory. And this little piece inside is what we put there. So there are two separate projects that were combined into one Palpissimo. And one set of students made a modified micro DMA system that can drive eight SPI ports and, you know, some schedule some data transfers. The idea was to be able to uh, collect data from several multi-channel ADCs. And that's why, I mean, it was used for EEG uh, kind of applications. And the other one was a hardware accelerator for, guess what, uh, neural network acceleration in quantized uh, parts. So this is, this is a student design at ETH Zurich. The students had about 14 weeks to work on this from beginning to end. Now. The other part, we were talking about this simpler architecture where we have uh, one processor and a cluster. So this is this kind of thing. So there would be a host which is running the programs normally and has maybe a memory controller and access to larger memories. And once there is a, uh, so this could be anything. And in this case, we are now building one with the Ariane core. This is a 64-bit core we have. And then there is a mini core accelerator where if you have a parallel workload, you will be able to off, uh, offload it. And uh, this one is then using multiple RIS-5 cores as well as maybe an accelerator for some specific uh, things. So uh, this is actually the hero platform that we use on FPGAs. This is the first one. Uh, in the hero platform, we are using as a core ARM cores. But the, the, this is the first one in ASIC where we used, uh, where we made the implementation also in ASIC, it's called Urania. Uh, and this one contains two pulp clusters, each have four cores, one accelerator and about, uh, 64 kilobytes of memory. And in the bottom part here, this is where you have the rest of the memory and you have the Ariane core, the 64-bit one with the FPUs. And the interesting part maybe is here, all around the periphery, we have a DDR3 controller and Phi. Uh, it's 8-bit before you get too excited. 
and it's not going to set any speed records or something like that. It was designed by TU Kaiserslautern, so it's their design, it's not our groups. Uh, same things, um, first of all, I don't know if they want to release it open source, and if they want to do it, it's still the same uh, problems that we had before. Uh, last two chips, we have Baikonur. This is actually a rerun of the Cosmodrome, an earlier chip we had. It's also a funny story. Uh, this we did in collaboration with Global Foundries. Uh, it had a plenty of things inside, but there was one commercial IP that they wanted on that chip. Guess what? Cosmodrome, everything works but that IP, because there was a bug in it. So we had to re-spin it. It has essentially two separate Ariane cores, one for optimized for high performance, one optimized for low power, a bunch of memory, so there's 1.25 megabytes of SRAM on this, and then there is an accelerator cluster which has 25 separate RISC-5 cores uh, that will be, hopefully, we can talk about it more soon. The last chip I'm talking about is Bilivik. This has a new core now. It's quite small. We, we didn't have so much area. This is also why, for example, at the bottom, uh, it doesn't have any pads. Uh, you try to squeeze in every last bit of area out of there. It has four cores. It's a small integer core, 32-bit, and it has a large 64-bit FPU. And all of them can access this uh, data memory at the same time. Why do we do this? Because there's a lot of uh, operations where we have streaming data. It has some extensions for streaming data, allowing the processor to continuously read, multiply, accumulate, and write back uh, to, to the memory. And uh, this is one way that we are trying to see if those workloads can be handled better by a programmable uh, CPU type of thing. So, the questions once again, are these projects open source? In principle, yes, we want to open source everything. We have to make sure that they are working. Otherwise, you end up being in a presentation as shown as, ah, they don't work, this is bad, this is horrible, this is stupid. So, we want to at least eliminate the first level of stupidity. And uh, some of them still need a bit of work and we need to verify whether or, I mean, we need to see whether or not the idea is sound. And uh, there are analog design blocks, layouts that cannot yet be open source. This is a reality. And the DDR3 controller, as I said, is not from Pulp, so I am not at liberty to say uh, what this is. So, because we have these open source releases and the silicon, there's been a lot of use of our core, so we are very happy about it. And uh, the problem is, both Zurich and University of Bologna, we are research groups, and we want to develop new architectures and play with them. We need the cores, efficient cores and peripherals to be able to do the things we are doing. But we are not so good or even interested in providing industrial level support to everything that we do. We try, and some of you are probably even frustrated at the level of support we are able to give. This is why we are collaborating with groups like the Open Hardware Group of uh, Rick or uh, the Low Risk from uh, Cambridge. To, um, to give uh, away our course to, to let them grow in a community where they, are, they receive better support. So I guess my time is about up. The most important thing is next time we are meeting in Istanbul. FOSI Istanbul will be from 13th to 15th of March. And uh, the location and things are actually already clear. It will be in the campus of Istanbul Technical University. And uh, over the following weeks, we will start uh, setting the website up properly. I am not very sure if we can do such a good organization as our host here. We will give it a try. And uh, the other thing is, Istanbul is fun, so maybe you would like to stay a bit longer before or after. And uh, of, of course, we would like to see you as, much, as long as possible in the talks as well. Okay, so this is it. If there are any questions, don't worry, I can come to you and answer the uh, questions. Or you ask them right away. You stay where you are. Okay, okay. <laughs> it was my job. You had one slide where it had this EFPGA on it. Can you tell a bit more what that is? Uh, the EFBJ is a product uh, made by QuickLogic. Uh, 
it, it is a 4,000 uh, unit uh, FPJ that was a hard macro that we uh, added into the system. If you're looking at the layout, it almost, I mean, it's two by two. The entire chip is three by three. In such a small scale chip, it looks like it's too big. But in a normal production chip, it would be a smaller part of the system. But it's not our design. I, we, we took it from QuickLogic as it is. About the analog IP, it wouldn't be possible to embed this uh, analog IP in vendor libraries and just import it as a black box in the design? Uh, I, I, I'm not very sure I, I got it. I mean, we cannot open source it. That's the only problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, when you go to the TSMC, they give you memory libraries and stuff like that that you just instantiate into your design. So it would be possible to do something like that with the analog IP? That so you want that? us to be giving support, like third-party support for them, so we send the layouts? It's not what we do, I mean. I, I, it's, are, you are also from a research institution. You wouldn't have the uh, interest and bandwidth to do it. So this is where the open hardware group and low risk and the others will come in. We are hoping that there will be more hardened IP that you can just drop into, uh, into the designs. That's, that's the, uh, that will happen. Okay. And they will also have probably licenses. For example, open hardware group will have the capability to hopefully have licenses from the EDA companies. If you pay for the license, then that issue with uh, the EDA companies blocking you go away. We do not pay the same price, so this is why they are upset. Okay, thank you. I didn't forget you over there. I'm just going to minimize my running. Uh, that's yeah. not fair. I was running. <laughs> the question is about vector uh, core. Do you have, what's your plans for next uh, generation of vector cores? Vector cores. Okay, so um, uh, we didn't tape out one yet. This is why I had only the chips. We have a, a design actually is being presented, I think, on Tuesday in the RISC-5 meeting in France, in Paris. Uh, Matthäus will be there. He is presenting it. And I think he will be also at the summit. So we have uh, one design. Um, yeah, we also like to play with it. But. Yes, about the um, FPGA uh, part, you, you, you've got uh, you can use uh, open source tools for uh, synthesis, uh, plus and root, and uh, bit string. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not our design, so you could talk to Brian about it. It uses, they have their own placement and routing tool uh, called Aurora. And for the synthesis, they are using Mentor Precision, but I'm pretty sure it would also work with, uh, with open source tools. I'm fairly convinced, but Brian can maybe give you more ideas about that. Do you want to? Where are you? <laughs> yeah, so as he was saying, uh, right now we have closed source tools, uh, vendor specific, and we use Mentor uh, Precision for Synthesis, and we support any Verilog simulator. The reason why our CTO, Tim over there, and myself are here is to explore how we could actually do open source tooling in a way that's beneficial for, for people to use the FPJ, specifically software engineers that don't know or don't want to do anything in Verilog and VHDL. So stay tuned. We'd like to open source that. Um, it's just not yet. Coming. It's not so easy, is it? Very, very quick, but the... Um the name Mr. Wolf I saw yesterday, and what's the background with that? Why the name? Because Mr. Wolf solves problems. Oh. <laughs> it's from Pulp Fiction. It's the guy that cleans up. It's not Clifford, I thought. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. But yeah, Clifford also solves problems. So I guess Harvey Keitel and Clifford have a resemblance. Why not? Um, this is just an echo of that other question as well. You know, about tools to actually then make access to the FPGA. It sounds like it's, it's going to happen at some point in the future. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. It looks like great. Thank you. Looks like we've run out of questions. So thank you, Frank. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs>